for, in 2 Timothy 3, 7, where it says some people are ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They read the word of God. They understand it. They have a passion for it. But when contradictions come, they don't know what to do with some of these contradictions. Oftentimes, if, if you go out and you talk to people that profess to be Christians and you ask them, well, hey, what, what exactly is the gospel? You'll hear all kinds of different things. You'll hear things like repent and be baptized, uh, make Jesus the Lord of your life, invite him into your heart, um, commit your life to Christ. Those are kind of very common things that you've heard the last 20, 30, 40 years because they're real popular at evangelical seminars. And it sounds great, but really none of that's the gospel. Greetings, my brothers and sisters in Christ. This is Bob Barbie here. Today, we're going to be talking about more right division in the Word of God. And today, we're going to be talking about how rightly dividing applies to our salvation. How are we saved? Which gospel are we saved under? The gospel of the kingdom or the gospel of grace? The gospel of the kingdom preached by Jesus in the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to all the Jews, the lost sheep, of the house of Israel or the gospel of grace preached by Apostle Paul in the Pauline epistles Romans through Philemon to all the Gentiles back then and even to us Gentiles today and by the way these are teachings from God himself Jesus Christ himself given unto Paul to relay unto us where Jesus chose Paul to be the spokesman for this gospel the gospel of grace that we are in right now just like God chose Moses to bring forth the gospel of the law during the Old Testament. And folks, there are two different gospels at the time of the preaching of Paul. You got the kingdom gospel and the gospel of grace. You have the kingdom gospel preached by Peter and the 12 apostles who were taught by Jesus Christ himself face to face with them for three and a half years in Israel. And the gospel of grace preached by Apostle Paul which was also taught by Jesus Christ, given to Apostle Paul through the revelation of the Holy Spirit. So you can see here, Jesus had a physical ministry here on the earth where he taught the 12 apostles face to face. And this is because it deals with physical Israel here on the physical earth. And then after Jesus was resurrected and glorified, he went to heaven and began his heavenly ministry, which involves the body of Christ that was brought forth to Apostle Paul through the revelation of the Holy Spirit. So as you can see here, we have a gospel for an eternal physical ministry here on the earth and a gospel for a ministry that's eternal in the heavens. Two totally different gospels, two totally different groups of people with two totally different eternal destinies. Peter and the twelve apostles preached the gospel to the circumcision which were the Jews and Apostle Paul preached the gospel of the uncircumcision which was to the Gentiles, which is the gospel of grace that we are saved under today. And here is proof in the word of God of these two gospels operating side by side at the same time. During the time Paul was walking the earth, if you go to Galatians chapter 2 verse 7, our Apostle Paul goes on to say here, but contrary wise, when they, who are Peter and the twelve apostles, saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision, which are the Gentiles, us today, was committed unto me, me, who is Paul, because he's speaking here, as the gospel of the circumcision, which are Jews, was unto Peter. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision that means he who is Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, has wrought, has taught, has established the gospel of the circumcision unto Peter. The same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And notice how he's saying that this gospel was wrought unto Peter, not just wrought unto all the twelve apostles. He's isolating Peter. Why? Well, go back and see what Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, his eternal earthly church. 
his earthly ecclesia that will be completely established during the millennial reign of Christ after the seven-year tribulation and also on a new earth to come. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And then it goes on to say in Galatians 2.9, And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, which is us Gentiles, and they unto the circumcision, which are the Jews. So there you go. There are two Gospels, one specifically tailored for Israel, God's royal eternal elite for the earth, the Jews, and the other Gospel under Apostle Paul is specifically tailored for God's royal eternal civilization in the second and third heavens. But a lot of people are taking bits and pieces from each of these two different Gospels and they are creating alternate inaccurate Gospels. So let me ask you this, do you really want to take that chance on those alternate Gospels? You only get one chance to do this everybody, you only get one life here on earth no matter how long that is to get this right. Because if you don't, well, I think you know where you're going to go after you die. And we don't want to see that happen to you. So please, don't be stubborn. I had to overcome this hurdle just like you are about to right now. And many of you have already overcome this hurdle. But please, just take the time to listen to this video. Consider these words. And if you reject the whole thing, then that's up to you. It's your choice. Like I said, you only get one life to get this right, everybody. It's your eternity. So in today's video, you're going to have Christopher Maskey of Last Call to Calvary YouTube channel and John Versigen of Berean Bible Ministries. They are going to be identifying, separating, and breaking down both Gospels by rightly dividing the Word of Truth. Today, we are going to be diving into the Word of God. We're going to be going over what exactly right division is. Uh, I got a special guest tonight. I got Brother John on with Berean Bible Ministries. Today, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to go over what the clarity of the gospel is, what the, the gospel is not. Is there more than one gospel? Um, so we're, me and John are actually, we're going to be doing a 10-week study on what rightly dividing means. Uh, starting from the very bottom, we're going to be, just like I said last week, we're going to try to for in second timothy 3 7 where it says some people are ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth they read the word of god they understand it they have a passion for it but when contradictions come they don't know what to do with some of these contradictions so we're going to hopefully get people over this hurdle um with everything going on with this this covid 19 virus and everything people are inside we're just asking you guys sit down with us, listen to the words we have to say, listen to some of the teachings we're going to give, and just listen with an open mind. And then from there, you make a decision on whether or not you want to follow right division or not. Um, but it's blessed me tremendously. John's been a blessing to me. Um, so tonight, the first lesson what we're going to speak about is the simplicity of the gospel. We're going to hopefully clarify it for everyone. Um, so if you would, John, just hopefully, uh, you know, just introduce yourself, and then hopefully from there, we can dive in and, and get started. Excellent. Thank you very much, Chris. Yeah, and I just want to welcome everybody, as you have done, to our, our broadcast here. And as Chris mentioned, uh, that what we're going to attempt to do here is put together a 10-part 10, a 10 podcast answering the question, basically, what is dividing the word of truth and what difference does it make? My background is originally from San Antonio, Texas. I went to Texas A&M University, graduated there. Uh, I was in a Corps of Cadets and got a degree in biomedical science and went straight into the Marine Corps as an officer and spent uh, several years in the Marine Corps. And, and it was as a junior in college that I actually became a believer. I was raised as a Roman Catholic and so had a lot of questions uh, about salvation and about, you know, Bottom line is what happens after you die and where do you go when you die? And of course, as a Catholic, I was always taught about purgatory, that kind of thing. But I came to understand from scripture that I could absolutely know for sure that when I died, I would go to heaven to be with the Lord Jesus Christ, not based upon any work that I ever had done or could do or ever will do, but truly based upon his finished work at Calvary. And of course, that changed my life. And then it was shortly after that that we were introduced to, my wife and I, we were introduced to the principle of rightly dividing the word of truth. And 
when we came across that, I mean, it truly, it, it forever changed my understanding of scripture. I mean, it was a radical shift in my thinking uh, with coming to understand that principle. And so um, you and I have uh, had some great time in the Word of God together by phone and by messaging, that type of thing. Lots of questions, spending some time together in, in the Scripture. And as a result of that, that's what has kind of led us to putting together this presentation. And Chris, as you mentioned just a moment ago, that we're, we're not asking the audience, those of you that are listening to us, we're not asking you to agree or disagree with us. That, that's not the objective. At this point, all we're asking you to do is this. We're going we're gonna to look at a lot of verses of Scripture over our time together these next, next several weeks. And all we're asking you to do is just consider. In fact, the Apostle Paul says this over in 2 Timothy. He says, consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. And, and I remember years ago, a guy asked me about that verse. He says, have you ever really considered what that verse said? And I, said, I thought, well, I thought I had, you know, <laughs> And uh, he said, listen, look at that verse. If we will consider what the Apostle Paul says, if we, will, if we will look at things the way the Apostle Paul looks at things in, in his scripture, then that is how the Lord will give you understanding in the entire word of God. And man, that, when he said that, I went, whoa, I, I never thought about that verse that way. And so that's really what we're asking you to do, those that are going to be listening to us, is just, just consider this. You might completely disagree with the, might, some things we say, you might, might, might make you just fight and mad kind of thing, <laughs> but that's all right. Uh, just consider the presentation and the presentations that we do over the next several weeks. And then you're going to have questions, write your questions down. We're going to do two weeks focusing, especially on the questions that you send to us and that you post on the chat room and so forth. So we do want to address your questions, but at this point, we're just saying, just, just, just now, don't make any judgment. Just, just think about what we're conveying, looking at the verses that we're saying, and, and then allow the Word of God to do what it does. And, it, and that is to all of us, it, it teaches us. So that's kind of our objective and our goal here. Absolutely. And, you know, John and I, we sat down, we kind of wrote out, if we're going to be doing 10 weeks of studying right division, what exactly we wanted to tackle and what, ex what exactly did we want to go over? The very first thing that him and I came to agree on was we need to go over the gospel. We need to make sure yes. whoever's listening to this, there's no discrepancy on what the gospel is today. And this truly, John, is what it got me in, intrigued with right division because I've always, I've always been a, an advocate for preaching the, the gospel of grace and, and trusting in the finished work of the cross. And I've been defending that for years and, and right division. Uh, it kind of clears up everything and it, we, we get a, a very, very definitive gospel and, uh, and there's no contradictions when you rightly divide the word of God. So um, we wanted to first, before we dive into anything, we want to go over the gospel. It's yes. obviously one of the most important aspects of, of what right division is. It, it clarifies that completely. There's no, no questions at all. So uh, first off, John, let, let's dive right in. Um, yes. What is the gospel? The good news today that justifies a man. Uh, and then from there, after we, we go over this, I just think we should go over, you know, is there only one gospel throughout the word yes. of God? Um, yes, so absolutely. Yeah. It, like you said, there's a moment ago, understanding the gospel is without question the most critical thing to understand. In fact, I said before that the, the, the purpose of life is to come to understand why did Jesus Christ come? That's the purpose of life. You, you, you can live this life. You can make money. You can become popular. You can, like, look at this way. Kobe Bryant, one of the most influential, most popular, most wealthy individuals really in, in modern age. Death still got him. It was tragic. It was awful, but it still got him. And I said that to say this, that you could become famous and powerful and rich and wealthy and influential. But if you haven't come to terms of why Jesus Christ, why he entered into this world, why he went to the cross, why he died, if you haven't come to terms with that, none of that stuff matters because you're going to die and you're going to go to hell when you die. That's what the word of God says. This is the most critical issue that you can possibly get. So that's why we figured that, you know, th this is the thing to make sure that we set out real clearly. There's truly a lot of confusion 
about the gospel. Simply put, let's open just briefly and quickly here. Look over to uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Look over to 1 Corinthians 15. And uh, oftentimes, if, if you go out and you talk to people that profess to be Christians and you ask them, well, hey, what, what exactly is the gospel? You'll hear all kinds of different things. You'll hear things like repent and be baptized, uh, make Jesus the Lord of your life, invite him into your heart, um, commit your life to Christ. Those are kind of very common things that you've heard the last 20, 30, 40 years because they're real popular at evangelical seminars and presentations. But uh, but really, none of that's the gospel. Not, not, let me ask it this way. The word gospel means good news. So if someone comes along and says, okay, do you want to hear the gospel? And you say, yes. And they say, well, commit your life to Christ. Okay, sounds great. But ask them, how are they doing at that? Yep. I mean, make Jesus the Lord of your life. It sounds wonderful, but it isn't true. Because how the guy that's telling you to do that, ask him how he or she is doing at it. If it, what is the good news in the news that tells you in order to be right in the eyes of God, you've got to endure till the end. What's the good news about that? When, when you know you can't, when you're honest with yourself, look at these verses right here over in first Corinthians 15, we're just going to jump right into the context here. Verse three and four, it says this, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now those verses right there tell you the heart of what the gospel of the grace of God is. And that is simply this, that based on the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins, not his own sins, but died for our sins, my sins and your sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, the word of God makes it very, very clear that when a person will believe that, when a person will trust that, that news, that's good news, they'll trust that news, and that news alone for their salvation, that God will truly give them salvation, give them life, and righteousness as a completely free gift. Now that's in contrast with, for example, Matthew 24 that says, he that shall endure to the end shall be saved. You see, those the two different, that's two different sets of information. And when you come to understand the gospel, the grace of God, truly one of the results is that you can rest in the peace that you have with God. So what we want to do this evening is really focus on that, the clarity of the gospel, the confusion that exists out there, and what will dispel the confusion. Amen. Like you said, and for anyone watching this, you, you've probably been a part of, of some sort of denominational part of Christianity. Uh, you could ask 10, other pe 10 people what the gospel is, and you could get 10 completely different answers. You know, you, you could get uh, the Pentecostals who, who say you have to be speaking in tongues and you have to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, the, this Torah observant group that's going around and, you know, telling people that they have to follow law and, and Torah. Um, you know, Paul, you know, water baptism, people say, circumcision, uh, you know, all these things people are... are trying to add on to the gospel. So in some way they're having a little piece of saving themselves, you know, and it's, it's yeah. that kind of, uh, and, and rightfully said, they, they all have scripture to back up everything they're saying. Yeah. So, yeah. but that is where, you know, that's the problem when you, you see everything and it, it's written in the word of God, you know, there is scripture that says, you know, repent and be baptized. Um, when you go in and cherry pick scriptures and then you, you present it as the gospel, it could be very dangerous when you go out uh, and you're preaching this to people. When, when you're taking away from what you just read in first Corinthians 15, that it is a free gift. It's trusting that Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again on the third day. This is a problem where people today don't even really know the gospel because they're looking throughout the word of God to find it rather than let's, let's hone in on what the gospel is today. Um, so 
with that problem, wh- where do we go from here when, when we do see these contradictions? Like when you said, James, James says it, faith plus works, you know, it's not, can, can faith save a man? And we know our, uh, the Apostle Paul says it, it is not by works. It is by the grace of God through faith that we're saved, not of works, so no man can boast. Um, so what do we do with these contradictions? And obviously, anyone that's a, a student of the Word of God has come to these contradictions. I know I sure have for years. And rather than spiritualize what the, the meaning of the Scriptures are, um, what would you suggest we, we do with these contradictions when, when it, it, simply just trying to find out what the gospel is today? Yeah, Chris, that's such an important and 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 powerful question with the with a, a, the answer that it really makes the difference about everything. But look with me. Let's let's all turn to a couple of passages. Go to, for example, Matthew twenty four, if you would look over to Matthew twenty four, and then we're going to compare that with uh, a couple of other passages. Look over to Matthew twenty four. And look at verse 13. Uh, my background, as I mentioned, I was a Roman Catholic. And, and this is one that I, I mean, I thought this is what I needed to do in order to be right with God. Matthew 24, verse 13, it says this, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And that's what that verse says. Now, obviously, there's a context. We'll talk about that momentarily. But as, as someone who was raised as a Roman Catholic, I, I genuinely believe that in order for me to be right in the eyes of God, with, 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 at least with any expectation of that ever happening, I needed to endure till the end. And then you made reference to the passage in the book of James, James chapter number two, where faith says that uh, can faith alone save a man? Faith without works is dead kind of a thing. And then when you compare that with over here in Romans chapter number three, the Apostle Paul uh, says it this way. Look over to Romans and chapter three here. And I'm going to jump down to verse uh, 24, Romans three twenty-four. He says this, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. I'm going to skip a couple of verses here, not because they're not important, they're critically important, but just because we want to be aware of the time and, and we have a lot of verses to look at. But if you look at verse 28, he says this, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. So it, it sure, it sure raises a question and should raise the question that, that the verses are not saying the same thing. You, you kind of mentioned it a moment ago that what people do, they, they kind of explain away one passage by the other passage. They, uh, a traditional approach where people who recognize that Paul is saying one thing with regard to justification. James uses the same word, justification. People say this about James. They say, well, James is talking about justification before men. Well, the, the problem with that is Christ says, do not your righteousness before men. But James is not talking about justification before men. That doesn't make any sense at all. But what people do is that they say, well, James and Paul, really, they're kind of saying, saying the same thing. And I'm saying, I can read, and so can you. They're not saying the same thing. Don't be afraid to say that. Don't be afraid to disagree with the theologians and people out there. You can read. You've got a Bible and so forth. If, 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 in order to understand the Bible and believe the Bible, we first got, got, got to be able to acknowledge that what we're reading is what it really says. And so when you read those verses there, it's, it's clear that, when you're reading verses about salvation that you find in the Gospels, and then when you're reading verses about salvation in Paul's epistles, they, they're just different in what they say regarding how a person is to be saved. Years ago, when uh, my wife and I, we were, we were dating at the time, we had, got, we had attended this uh, Christian conference thing, and, and when we were coming back from this thing, we, we were talking about some of these things, and I can't remember whether it was Lori or myself, but we asked the question, have you ever noticed or wondered that salvation in Paul's epistle seems to be easier than it is in the Gospels? And it's interesting because we both acknowledge, yeah, it, that's, that's right. But, but we said, yeah, but, but we're going to follow Jesus. 
because that's the default position, right? It, we're all supposed to be, quote, unquote, following Jesus. And so you go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But the more that we thought about it, the more we realized that no matter how hard we tried to follow Jesus, according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the fact is we just, we didn't, and we weren't, no matter how hard we tried. No. And that can be very convicting, but you know what else it can be? Man, it can sure open the door wide open to a heart that's asking, okay, Lord, what's, what's going on here? Why this difference? And so the, you know, the old, the old thing, the, the, the key to understand is as far as when, when those verses say what they say, whether it's Matthew 10, whether it's James 2, whether it's Hebrews 6 and so forth, the verses all have a context. They have a setting about them. The principle of rightly dividing the word of truth truly is the key to understanding really everything in the Bible. 2 Timothy 2.15 is where you take that phrase from, where the Apostle Paul says, rightly dividing the word of truth. The word of truth is the Bible. And God has placed points of division, points of demarcation in the Bible. So when he says, rightly dividing the word of truth, then there's a way to determine whether or not you're doing it correct or incorrectly. So let's just look at a couple of other things very quickly about when Christ says, he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And understand this principle. Dispensational Bible study, or rightly dividing the word of truth, it's, it's the principle, it's, it's the acknowledgement that while all the Bible is for us, it's, it's just not all to us, and nor is it all about us. And, and people really do understand that concept, people who profess to be Christians and believers. I mean, after all, go ask anyone who professes to be a believer today and ask them, are they following the entire Bible? And they'll say, well, no. And if, if, by the way, if they say yes, ask them which sacrifice did they offer today, okay? <laughs> okay, and so forth. Uh, so Christian people who profess to be Christians, they at least understand the concept that, yeah, there were some things in the Old Testament, yeah, that don't apply today. So, so they typically divide the Old Testament from the New Testament, Genesis through Malachi, from Matthew through Revelation. But what you're going to find when it comes to the way the Apostle Paul rightly told us to write the by the word of truth, the, the great point of division is not between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Rather, it's between God's purpose and plan in relationship to what he's going to do on the earth and his purpose and plan in relationship to what he's going to do in heavenly places. Now, having said that, let's briefly look at a couple of verses here uh, uh, quickly. Go, go with me to Matthew. We're going to do. We're going to look at four passages: uh, three in the book of Matthew, one in the book of Mark. And if you'll get this principle, if you'll get these verses in Matthew and Mark, this will it'll absolutely set the stage for understanding why Christ said things like, "He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved." It'll set the stage for understanding what the gospel of the kingdom is. And, of course, Chris, as we go through this, if you have a question, then by all means, uh, I'll bring it up here. Look over to Matthew chapter 3 at verse 2. Matthew 3 and verse 2. John the Baptist shows up on the scene of human history, and he says it this way. It says, and saying, repent ye. Okay, why? Here's why. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Look over to chapter 4 of Matthew chapter 4 look at verse 17 from that time Jesus began to preach and to say repent and and why here's why for the kingdom of heaven is at hand look quickly if you would over to chapter number 10 look over to chapter number 10 when he sends the apostles out on their first and original commission he says this in verse 7 and as you go preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand now, now, what was the common denominator between all three of those verses? It was the fact that the kingdom of heaven was at hand, right? If you'll turn with me to Mark this time, go to Mark this time in chapter number one. And I just wonder if people have ever uh, uh, stopped to think about, well, well, what does that mean? What did it mean that the kingdom of heaven was at hand? 
Look over to Mark chapter number one. I'm going to jump to verse 14. We'll read verse 14 and 15. The Lord Jesus Christ says this as recorded by Mark. He says, now, after that John was put in prison, so this is Mark writing, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, and notice what he said, quote, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Notice what Christ said in verse 15 with regard to something about time fulfilled. Let me ask it a different way. In, in Matthew, read those three verses about the kingdom of heaven being at hand. What made the kingdom at hand? I mean, people will say this. They'll say, well, because Christ was there. Well, that, technically, that's not true. That, that's not what made the kingdom at hand. What made the kingdom at hand was the time schedule that had been given back in the days of Daniel in, in, in Daniel chapter number nine, God had Israel on a time schedule. And on the time schedule, he told them, is, your, your Messiah would show up at a certain time and so forth. That's why Christ was there when he was there. His, his, the, his, the, the forerunner, John the Baptist, that's why John the Baptist showed up when he did. It's, it's interesting to think about, why is it that John the Baptist didn't arrive on the scene of human history, say, 50 years earlier or 10 years later? Why did the Lord Jesus Christ, why is it that he didn't arrive on the scene of human history, say 30 years before that or seven years later. Why did he show up when he showed up? He showed up because God is working on a time schedule. And because of the time schedule, that's what made the kingdom at hand. That's why the forerunner showed up when he did. That's why Christ was there when he was there with all the signs, the miracles, the wonders that were the credentials proving his claim that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Quickly, if you would, go back to Matthew chapter number three. That kingdom being at hand, that is the opportunity for, for God to establish his prophesied promised kingdom that he promised through the prophets in the Old Testament. It had entered the at hand phase when you come to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And there's something that God had told Israel that he was going to uh, prepare them for and to go through prior to the establishing of that kingdom. And John addresses that issue here in Matthew chapter number three at verse seven. Matthew 3, 7, he says this, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you, and then he says this, to flee from the wrath to come. There was a prophesied wrath that was to come, that was to precede the actual, literal, physical establishing of the kingdom being set up on the earth. So the kingdom, the prophesied kingdom, had entered the at-hand phase. John shows up as the forerunner calling Israel to, be, to repent because it was at hand. And what they were repenting from was in connection that they had to be saved from that impending wrath, that wrath to come. We'll talk more about that in future podcasts and so forth. So understand, when you're reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's vital, it's essential. If you're going to understand Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you have to remember the setting, the context was that at that time in history, the kingdom of heaven was then at hand. Everything that Christ did, his miracles, signs, wonders, everything he said, the parables, everything is all against the backdrop, the background being that the kingdom of heaven was then at hand. So when he's out preaching and he sends the, gospel, the apostles out to preach the gospel of the kingdom, then put that together with the fact that they were going to go through that wrath to come, and that'll tell you why he says things like we read earlier in Matthew 24, he that shall endure unto the end. The context is the end of the tribulation period they would enter into that kingdom. So at least gives, it, gives you, it gives us the background to go back and read those passages that people often use when they're trying to say what a person needs to, be, needs to do to be saved. It puts it back in its context to realize that the gospel of the kingdom was in the setting and background and context that the kingdom of heaven was then at hand. 
But you know what? The kingdom of heaven's not at hand today. It's been postponed. Think about that. It, it, this is just staggering. That was 2,000 years ago, as it were, that, that Christ said, that John the Baptist said, the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Man, at hand and 2,000 years, those aren't the same thing. If, I, if something's at hand, it's like within your lifetime, as it were. And something happened that that kingdom that was then at hand, it never came. Something happened. The Apostle Paul says it this way. Over here in Ephesians chapter number three, in Ephesians chapter number three, he says it this way. Ephesians chapter three and verse one, he says it this way. He says, for this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a four and few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Paul, Paul, Paul writes this book and he tells the Ephesians, guys, listen, when you read this, when you read the book here, that's how you'll understand what's going on. The ads, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, and so on. We'll deal with this in much greater detail in future podcasts. My point is this. The Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, in fact, the Holy Spirit through the pen of the Apostle Paul, right there in that verse, tells us what's going, tells us what's going on now in history. And he calls it the dispensation of the grace of God. That means that what heaven is dispensing to earth today is not the law. Paul says in Romans 6, 14, you're not under the law but under grace. God is dispensing grace today, as it were. That's why the gospel is called the gospel of the grace of God. You're saved by grace through faith. By grace are you saved through faith. We live by grace. We function under the basis of grace. I mentioned earlier, you're not under the law. You're under grace. We live in a different, completely different time in history compared to that which was happening when you're reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So that so, simple principle of understanding that all the Bible's for us, it's just not all to us, nor is it all about us. And we need to go to that part of the Bible that is specifically to us today for this dispensation in which we live historically to make sure that we understand the nature and the details about how a person today is saved. All right, so let's let's kind of slow it down a little bit. So what you were saying is when we when we read the four gospels, the gospel of the kingdom, okay, that is not the same gospel that Paul was preaching. There's no mention of the blood of Christ. There's no mention of just trusting in that he died, was buried, and rose again. Uh, so when we read, like you said, in the four gospels, the gospel of the kingdom that was preached, they were preaching the good news of the coming physical kingdom for Israel. Yes. As Christ is the Messiah. Exactly. They were they're promised Israel to be a nation of kings and priests to rule over and, and bless the entirety of the world. That's from the beginning of the word of God, what was promised to Abraham. They were promised the physical kingdom on earth where Christ was going to rule and reign with Israel uh, under their Messiah on, on earth. Yes. Um, as you made mention, there's been a, a change in that. Israel had fallen. So when we read the gospel, there's there's obviously not the same gospel being preached from what we read in, in, in from from John the Baptist, Jesus Christ preaching, repent, the kingdom, you know, the kingdom is at hand. Um, the gospel, the good news that they were receiving was not the good news that Paul received. It's not the same gospel today. So there are multiple gospels. There's multiple good news throughout the word of God. And that's what yeah. gospel means. It's good news. It's not, you know. A lot of people get hung up. Well, it, it's always been, there's only one gospel in the word of God. There's more than one gospel, obviously. And today there's only one gospel that, that justifies a man. And I think yeah. it's important that we, we go over that. But um, so when, when someone reads, obviously, the four gospels, like you said, looking in the context of what the, the gospel of the kingdom is, it's completely different than what we have today in the gospel of grace that was given to Paul. Yes, exactly. Yes, yes. You know, a couple of quick verses to consider along those very points that you're making. Look over quickly to Matthew 16, 
and then Luke 9 and Luke 18. Look at just these, just consider these verses here. Uh, Matthew 16, when you're reading Matthew 16, this is, it's, it's not completely late in the ministry of Christ, but it's not early on. It's definitely toward the last part of the ministry of Christ. And there's an interesting passage here in Matthew 16 and verse 21. The Lord, it says this, the record says this, it says, Matthew 16, 21, it says this, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Now watch Peter's response. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Now think about this way. We read that passage earlier in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4, that the heart of the gospel of the grace of God, you must preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for our salvation, for our justification, right? That's the heart of it. You cannot preach the gospel of salvation and the dispensation of grace. You cannot preach the gospel of the grace of God without preaching the shed blood of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection on the cross for our sins. And yet right here, it says that the Lord Jesus Christ, when he began to teach them, he was going to go to Jerusalem, be rejected, die, and rise again. And you can see Peter's response, that this shall not be unto thee. Then that, that's conclusive evidence that the gospel of the kingdom, because they'd have been preaching the gospel of the kingdom up to this point, but that's absolutely conclusive evidence that the gospel of the kingdom did not contain, listen very carefully, I say this, it did not contain as the heart of its message that Christ would go die for their sins, be buried, and raised again the third day. It, it, didn't, it, didn't, it didn't contain that. Look at, look at another passage. Go to Luke chapter number 9. Look over to Luke chapter number nine here. This is this is just amazing. Look over to Luke chapter number nine, if you would. And the Lord Jesus Christ, he this is when he, he gathers the disciples and he sends them out to preach and so forth. But look at verse six, Luke nine and verse six, and it says this. And they departed and went through the towns preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. So they're out preaching the gospel of the kingdom is the obvious context, okay? Now here's what I want you to do, is look at verse 44 of this same chapter. Luke 9, 44, let these saints sink down to your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. But they understood not this saying, and it was hid from them that they perceived it not, and they feared to ask him of that saying. If the gospel of the kingdom included that Christ was going to go to Jerusalem, he was going to be betrayed and die for their sins and be raised again the third day, day that, then that verse makes no sense that they didn't understand him. Look over to Luke chapter number 18. Look over to 18. This is nine chapters later. This is quite a, quite a bit time later after they'd been out preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Luke 18 at verse 31, and he says this. Luke 18, 31, it says this, Then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked and spitefully entreated and spitted on, and they shall scourge him and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. Now, now there's his death and resurrection. He tells them right there in that verse. But look at that next verse. And they understood none of these things. And this saying was hid from them. Neither knew they the things which were spoken. Listen, I submit to you that when they're preaching the gospel of the kingdom, they're not going around telling their fellow Israelites that, hey, Christ is here. He's going to go die on the cross for your sins, be buried and raised again the third day. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That, that's not what they're preaching. And when Christ begins to tell them he's going to go die, die and so forth and rise from the dead, they, there's a massive pushback from them on that. Even after his death and resurrection, you come to early Acts, Acts chapter number two. And, and I know you've read this before. What, does Peter 
Does Peter talk about Christ's death and resurrection? He sure does, but he doesn't preach it as good news. He preaches it as an all-out indictment. Remember when David, King David, got word from that Amalekite, I think it was an, it was an Amorite or Amalekite, that he slew Saul? And, and David said, I mean, David would had a couple of chances to kill Saul. And David said, don't you dare touch the Lord's anointed. When that man came and said he slew Saul, David said, you slew the Lord's anointed. And then that setting in context, the Lord's anointed was Saul. And Saul turned out to be not such a good king. We all know that. Well, you fast forward to who the Lord Jesus Christ was, the Prince of Peace, the Messiah, with all the credentials and evidence to prove that he was who he said he was. And Peter there in Acts chapter number two, he says to Israel that you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Read Acts chapter number two. He doesn't preach the cross of Christ there as good news. He preaches it as an all out indictment of what they did against their anointed. And yet you come to the writings of the apostle Paul and he says in a passage like over here in first Corinthians chapter one, he says, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it. The preaching of the cross is the power of God. Through the information that the resurrected and ascended Lord Jesus Christ gave to the apostle Paul, Christ conveys and discloses to Paul, he says, listen, Paul, there's some work on the cross there that I did, that Christ did on the cross there. It was previously undisclosed. And he says, Paul, I want you to go out and preach the riches of God's grace that have been opened up to the Gentiles, as it were, and indeed to the whole world, through Christ's finished work on the cross. You can't preach the gospel of the grace of God without preaching the death of burial, and resurrection of Christ, his death for our sins, and because he became sin for us and was raised again the third day. You can't preach the gospel of the grace of God without preaching that message. So absolutely, you are correct. There are different gospels in the Bible. There's, there's not two different gospels in the dispensation of grace by which someone is saved, but truly, the gospel of the kingdom is different in its content than the gospel of the grace of God. Amen. And I think the, the, it's important we just emphasize, too, it's always been God's grace how any man was saved. And it's yes. always been you, through faith. You know, yes. um, today, obviously trusting in the, the, the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, you mentioned that Paul was revealed something. It was a mystery, something that was hid in God. Uh, it was not hid in God that Israel would through Jesus Christ, through their Messiah, become a nation of kings and priests, and that they would one day obtain a kingdom. That was nothing hidden. That was what they were expecting. That's why John the Baptist said, repent. The kingdom is at hand. This, yes. was nothing, this was nothing new. This was nothing revealed to Paul that was never revealed to anyone else. What was revealed to Paul is, when, when we say today we're saved by grace through faith, is that Every human, since Israel has fallen, can be saved, not by works of the law, not by Sabbath keeping, not by uh, Torah observance, not by doing anything, but by hearing and believing that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again on the third day. Amen. That is something you cannot find apart from Paul's epistles. That's correct. Um, That's correct. Yes. So with that said, we need to believe what the Word of God says, and, and right division clearly shows us, like you mentioned, John, we, we don't see this anywhere. So when we read Paul's epistles and we read what we you know in the four gospels and we see this contradiction, this is where right division comes in and says, okay, they're different. They're not written all to us. Why are they different? And what do we do with these scriptures now that we, we in light of knowing that they're not all written to us? Uh, we now, as you said, we, we now know that when the four gospels, Christ was preaching of a physical kingdom, Israel fell. Paul was given the revelation of the mystery that today 
All humans will have an equal opportunity by trusting the gospel. We need to trust that. When Paul was give, said he was given a, a mystery that was not revealed anywhere else, not to try and go back and look at elsewhere in Scripture, it is something that you can't find anywhere else in the Word of God yes. other than his epistles. And we need to trust in what the Word of God says and, and rely on when we hear the gospel and we believe it, we are justified. And, and what does it mean knowing this now for our eternal security? Can we Can we trust that? believing the gospel. There's a ton of scripture that Paul says that we are eternally secured. So if, if you want to touch on that, hopefully anyone listening can, can understand we are eternally secure in Christ and our salvation is nothing we did to earn it is nothing we can do to yes. lose it. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And that would be, uh, that's really the heart of, I think what we want to address uh, in the time remaining today. And, yeah. and um, I understand this way that you, you said earlier in kind of the introduction here that, that everyone has verses. Everyone has their, their key verses that they go to to uphold or support whatever the particular approach to Scripture is. We have our verses, no doubt. So, so how do you decipher for, through all that stuff? Well, let's go quickly over to Romans 11. Here's what the Apostle Paul claims in Romans 11. He says, at verse 13, for I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. The Lord Jesus Christ, according to the record of the apostle Paul in his writings here, the Lord Jesus Christ saved Saul of Tarsus and appointed him as a brand new and a separate apostle, the apostle of the Gentiles. And in doing so, he also committed to his trust information about this new dispensation called the dispensation of grace. And so at least what that helps us understand is that you, you don't have to, you know, kind of mesh and mix all the verses together and, and force Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to be saying the same thing that Paul says, or force Hebrews to Revelation to say the same thing as Paul says, or just force them all together. It, it, that's completely unnecessary. And it isn't the way to study the Bible in the Bible anyway. Rather, understand the setting, the context, what's going on. It absolutely helps us to understand, and in the context of our podcast today, our study today, the, the clarity of the gospel. So let, let's just, to answer your question, that when someone, can you really believe these things, and what does it result in? Can it result in absolute assurance of salvation instead of I mean, living a life of, of dread and wonder, you, I mean, I always wonder, did, have you ever done enough? Did you do enough? Did you sin? Did you out sin God today? Did you, you were supposed to turn over a new leaf? Well, what if you didn't? Did you, did you what, people say, commit your life to Christ? Well, what if you kind of did, but then you backslid, so they say, and because you're neither too hot, new, too cold, is God going to spew you out like revelation there and so forth? Let's just look at some verses here. And let's just let the Word of God speak. Let's let the Holy Spirit, through His Word, speak. We're going to look at Romans chapter 3 here. We read this particular verse uh, a little bit earlier. Look at Romans 3, verse 24. Notice how he says, verse 23, you can clearly see the problem is we've all, <laughs> all of sin and come short of the glory of God. That, that's a universal problem. Now watch Paul come up with the good news, the solution, the answer. It, he actually begins back up at verse 21. He says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. Not upon all them that promise to do better next time or make Jesus the Lord of their life or turn over a new leaf or commit their life, oh, but to them that believe. For there is no difference for all of sin that comes short of the glory of God. Where are all already condemned promising god that you're going to do better next time is telling him a lie you just make the situation worth worse committing your life to christ is committing to do something that the only person that ever has committed their life to god the father perfectly and never failed is jesus christ no one in history has ever successfully quote unquote and every thought, word, and deed of their, of their life committed their life to Christ. No one's ever done that because we've all already sinned. And our salvation is not based upon our fidelity. 
our faithfulness, our ability to commit, to endure, to keep the law. That verse says it's based upon the faith of Jesus Christ, his righteousness. And then he says at verse 24, being justified. That means to be declared right. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Redemption is in Christ. It's not in religion. It's in the living, resurrected person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Redemption is in him. So you got to get in him if you want to have redemption. And you get in him freely. I, 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 I'll often use this illustration. Let's say you go to the store. Let, let's say you guys, let, guys, let's say you go to the hunting store, okay, a camping, fishing, hunting store, and you're going to buy a new tent or something like that. And there's, they've got a special going on. And, and, and it's a really nice tent. And they say, hey, for the next uh, – the, the, the Kmart special, whatever, for the next hour, this tent is free. Okay? So, wow, man, you grab that thing, you go to the, you go to the, uh, the cash register and say, hey, I want this tent. And so the guy says, okay, that'll be 50 bucks. And you say, well, no, 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 no. You guys just announced over the PA and there's a sign right there that says it's free. They say, well, it doesn't really mean free. What would you feel like if that happened to you? You understand? Or, or, or ladies, let's say you go to the store and you buy a pair, you're going to get a pair of shoes and it says free and the same concept happens. You, you feel totally lied to. That verse doesn't lie to you. I, 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 that verse, God is not lying to you in that verse. He says, being justified freely now, now now for just a moment just suspend arguing with me about this because people argue with me about that verse all day well it can't be that free it can't be that easy it can't be that simple but what if it is just just suspend your arguing for just a minute here what if that verse really means what it says what if god really and truly well, justify a sinner, the guy previously in the previous verse, all of sin and control. What if he really and truly will justify you without cost or obligation or promise on your part to do better? But he will justify you freely based upon the finished work of Christ at Calvary. After all, after all he's the one in whom redemption resides. He goes on to tell you at verse 25, the basis upon which he can do that. He says, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. That's a big word with a, with a wonderful, it just means fully satisfying payment, sacrifice, propitiation through faith in his blood. The first person ever to have faith in the blood of Christ, ever to believe the blood of Christ that would be shed one day would satisfy the justice of God. The first person ever to believe that is God the Father. God the Son, and then God the Holy Spirit. That's what he believes about it. That's why he could raise Jesus Christ from the dead that third day. When Jesus Christ from the cross says, it is finished, and he gave up the ghost, the Father's response was three days later, he raised him from the dead, saying, yep, I agree. Paul goes on to say here, he says, verse 20, I'm, I'm leaving a lot out here. He says, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. I'm just asking you to think, what if that's true? What if it really means what it says? Look over to chapter four. Look over to chapter four at verse four and five. He says, chapter four, verse four and five, now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. If you're trying to work for your salvation, if you're trying to keep the law, do better, make a promise to God that it be a, be a promise keeper, commit your life to Christ, turn over new leaf, all, all of that stuff that people say, if that's you trying to work for your salvation, then you don't get a gift. You, there's a debt that is you're uh, 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 incurring. You see the verse right there? It says, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned. It, what you're getting, it's not reckoned upon the principle of the free gift principle. It's reckoned upon a debt. You owe a debt. There's an obligation. Watch the complete contrast. But to him that worketh not 
but believeth. By the way, that verse tells you that believing is not meritorious. It's not a work. It says, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Look, God is in the business of justifying not people who are doing better, not people who have who have turned over a new leaf and don't need anything from God. That verse says God is in the business of justifying the ungodly. That's me. And that's you. Amen. You understand? The ungodly, those are people that are out of the way, not in the way. The ungodly, those are people on the straight and narrow. Those are people out. Romans 5 says we were enemies of God. God is in the business of justifying the ungodly. What if that was true? I mean, what would it do in your heart if these verses are true? He says in Romans 5, 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1 says this. We're just quickly going through these verses, but look, look over to Ephesians in chapter number 1. Look at these verses. Ephesians 1, 6 says this. Ephesians 1, 6 says, To the praise of the glory of his grace. So that's his favor, his, 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 his willingness to give freely without cost. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. And the beloved is the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom the Father is well pleased. That's what he said to him audibly. When, when Christ came, John, the head opened up and the Father said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. But the Father also said it this way. He said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. The Father said both things. One for the audience, the benefit of the audience. One to the benefit of Christ. My point is this. When that verse says, the beloved, that is the one in whom the Father is well pleased. That verse says, God, when you, when you trust the blood of Jesus Christ, the person and work of Christ at, at Calvary there, when you trust in that for your salvation, God makes you accepted in the one that he is well pleased. What if that's true? The next verse goes on to say this, verse 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Now, now look at the standard. Look at the measuring stick. According to this standard, according to the riches of his grace. You know, think about that. The, Paul wrote this book to these human beings, these Ephesians, people like you, people like me. That verse says, he, he led them to believe that the, ex, that, that the extent of their forgiveness was, if you could take and measure however rich, however wealthy that God is in his willingness and his capacity to give freely without cost, the riches of his grace, that's how forgiven you are. That's how much forgiveness the blood of Jesus Christ was able to purchase. That's total forgiveness, not conditional forgiveness. Over in Colossians 2.10, it says, and ye are complete in him. Over in Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, it says, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Let me just, just kind of, that's a lot of verses to go to way, way too fast. But let me just ask it this way. If justification really is a free gift, if a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law, if being justified by faith, you have peace with God, the, the, the justice of God is forever for you and on your, on your side. If God makes you accepted in Christ the moment you believe, if God says that the extent of how forgiven you are is to the full extent of, of however valuable the blood of Jesus Christ is, the riches of God's grace. If God says 
He seals you with the Holy Spirit of promise the moment that you believe. If God says you're complete in Christ, if, if that's what God says about these things, then is it true? And if it's true, what is it likely to produce in your heart? And Chris, I'll kind of put that back to you because this is something that you and I have talked about quite extensively. So many people out there, they don't have peace. They don't have assurance. They don't really have hope. It's, they live in fear yeah. and doubt. But if all these things are true, what can this and what should this and what does this really bring forth in the heart of someone? Yep. The, the renewing of your mind every day for someone that comes to right division, you see what Paul's saying and you don't have to worry, you know, now when I'm reading it, contradicting elsewhere in scripture, when you know that you're justified by faith in the dispensation of grace, trusting in the death, burial, resurrection of what Christ did, you know that you are eternally secure and, and having that, having that uh, reassurance, that, that uh, complete lack of condemnation when you fall short, um, understanding that you're justified because of what Christ did. And in Amen. God's eyes, uh, Ephesians uh, 2, 5 through 6, it says, even when we were dead in sins, he quickened us together with Christ. By grace are we saved and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Whether you know it or not, the moment you heard the gospel, you were positionally seated in Christ in heavenly places. That's not something that the normal Christian would, with, without rightly dividing, they hear that scripture and they don't really believe it. You yes. can believe it. You can understand that you heard the gospel the moment you did. You were positionally seated in Christ. Not that It's not that just the Spirit of God lives in you, but you live in Christ. In Christ, yes. Understanding that and renewing your mind of that every day, that is how. You can allow the Spirit of God and through that and studying His Word. That is how you will see changes in your life. These changes yes. don't sustain your salvation. They don't keep you right. saved. But when you renew your mind and you have this assurance of your salvation, it is a complete game changer. It, this is the news that God wants you to know and that Satan doesn't want you to know. He doesn't want yes. you to know right yes. divided. He doesn't want yes. you to know okay, my gospel is this, and I get my instructions from Paul. He wants division in the body of Christ. He wants you to question your salvation. And this is why rightly dividing is so, so, so important. Jesus Christ told Paul to tell us that we are to be rightly dividing the word of yes, God. Yes, amen to that. That was not Paul's idea. That was from the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, um, you know, John, we, we spoke about coming to the knowledge of the gospel, it's, it's, a, it's a, a chain breaker. It's complete freedom when you know that you are perfected yes. in Christ because of what he did. I don't have to work hard. I don't have to try so hard to please God. He sees me as, as Christ. He sees me under his righteousness. And then now at that point, now I no longer live in fear. I don't live in condemnation. I, I go out and do these good works, these good deeds, not to try and earn it because I, I love the Lord and I know that I'm perfected because of what he did. Amen. Um, Yes. So that's what yeah. we wanted to accomplish tonight. If anything, we wanted to go over the simplicity of the gospel. You, you, uh, you obviously come to the place of recognizing yourself as a sinner and being separated from God because of these sins. You now trust that Christ was sufficient. He died on the cross, was buried in the tomb and risen on the third day to remove your sins and that you play no part other than just trusting in that to find salvation, to find this uh, complete and utter just forgiveness and a lot of Christianity today, most people don't feel forgiven. They they live right. in condemnation. They don't they don't yes. know this that that they are positionally eated, seated in Christ. They don't they don't have that in their lives, um, and that, that's what rightly dividing completely clears up. It Amen. gives us this assurance Absolutely. of our salvation, our eternal yes. security in Christ. Um, anything else to add, John? I think we kind of we covered you know yeah, everything. I, you know that's, that is so. I know you and I have talked about this that, that so many professing Christians live in, in fear and doubt and they just they wonder, especially when they they would like to serve God, they they want to live a God life, they want to please God, and yet so often in their life's experiences that they find that they fall short. And because they haven't been taught a clear gospel of the grace of God, then so many Christians live in guilt and defeat what's happening is that we're 
trying to live the life of the believer out of our own energy and our own resource because we think we got it until the end or we got to keep a promise we made to God to make him the Lord of our life. But what we come to realize, the preaching of the cross says, not only was Christ's work at the cross there, a finished work, the empty tomb something very loud as well. That the resurrected Christ is our life now. He's our resource. So just like the gospel, the grace of God teaches us that our justification is not in any way connected to our ability to work, perform God back. So to our sanctification, our growing as believers is not based upon our ability to impress God or pay him back, but rather it's one of your favorite verses, Galatians 2.20, right? I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live not, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. I live by his fidelity who loved me and gave himself for me. So really that whole thing about the gospel of grace takes and points our attention to the finished work of Christ at the cross there and that empty tomb. His death is the payment. His resurrection is the receipt. His new life, that's the life we received when we trusted him. Amen. Um, I think that was a, a perfect way to end it, John. I, I thank you for taking the time to go over this with me. Um, like we said earlier, we're going to be doing a 10 part study on this. We've yes. just begun to scratch the surface. I want to go over. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I'm super excited about this. I really am. Absolutely. I am too. And I, I like we said, I, I just ask you guys to just listen to these words with an open mind. Um, hopefully it'll bless you guys and, and give someone some kind of, obviously anyone living under condemnation or questioning their salvation. I hope tonight we cleared up what the gospel is, gave you some reassurance that you can trust that you are positionally seated in Christ. He lives in you. You live in him. You are justified the moment you believed in that. Um, now we walk in by faith. That's how we are to walk today. So, um, Today, we wanted to cover the gospel. Um, The next week, we're going to have another topic. Like John said, if you guys have any questions, please write them down. We're going to be doing a two-part series of just your questions to hopefully clear up anything on on rightly dividing and what it means. Um, John, if you have any last uh, words, uh, I'd love for you to just kind of close this out. Just like what you said there, this will definitely generate questions, and uh, we encourage. That's one of the ways we can learn, and, and we do learn. So your questions in and um as we proceed through this we're going to dedicate two since specific to answering questions what i suspect is that as you have questions you'll probably get some of those questions answered as we go through this series but send your questions in anyway for sure yes absolutely all right guys till next time take care thanks john thank you so much for joining us and have yourself a blessed evening in christ take care